Greetings, I'm Bob Fisher, and this is Design Intelligence. Martha Schwartz is a landscape architect, urbanist, artist, educator, and climate activist with a 40-year career that establishes her as one of the most distinctive and creative landscape designers in the profession. Her work and teaching focuses on the urban public realm and its importance in making cities climate-ready. On this edition of This is Design Intelligence, she talks to us about the winding trajectory of her career, the unique role of landscape architects in addressing climate change, and why working together and bold ideas are critical to tackling the climate issues we face today and into the future. Welcome to this edition of This is Design Intelligence, conversations with leadership voices in the built environment. Martha, I really do appreciate you taking the time to come and share your perspective with Design Intelligence today. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. And I really am honored to be here today. Fantastic. I wanted to jump right in and help orient people to the path that your career took. You play a variety of different roles in design and education and advocacy. Any one of them could comprise an entire career. So tell us a little bit about your professional journey and how you came to be involved in so many things. I come from a family of architects. Everybody's an architect. And I grew up on the floor of my father's office in Philadelphia. He, you know, he was a very important architect within Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, I, I was on the floor drawing and sketching and, you know, having fun. But I did realize that I was never going to be an architect. It was too constraining. I knew that. But I also grew up in the In the bottom of the Philadelphia Art Museum, going to art school as a little kid. And that was my thing. I was always good in art and I was always uh, interested in it. And I knew that that was what I wanted to be, was, was an artist. That was definitely going to be my trajectory. And in one sense, it, it has. I graduated from University of Michigan with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. And I had been following the Earthworks artists, you know, things, people like Christo or Walter Di Maria. And there were so many of them. I was just enamored with what they were doing in the landscape. These big, bold uh, sculptures uh, that really made you see the landscape in a very different way. And it was, let's see, it was in the late 60s and 70s where these people were working. But they, of course, it was it was a new idea. But I knew that this was something I wanted to do. And after graduating, I met with a wonderful teacher. Uh, I went to Michigan's Bug Camp, which is in northern Michigan, for biologists and uh, people who are working out in nature. And I was an art student. And they said, well, we haven't ever enro- enrolled an art student. And I was like, well, just make up another column for me. But they did. And I met a wonderful teacher who, he was an architect. And he showed me some wonderful pictures of French gardens. And there was this one garden called Park So that I was like, oh, my God. I can understand how those gardens actually create space that is overpoweringly beautiful and just overpowering, period. And, you know, I thought, well, you know what? The actual ability to create space outside was something that was very interesting to me. So he suggested, well, why don't you go into landscape architecture? I'm like, oh, you know, okay, because I didn't want to go into architecture. And so I went into landscape architecture, again, at the University of Michigan, because at that time, it was the design school. The other schools like Harvard, they were working on GIS and computers. There really was not a strong design program there. And then there was University of Pennsylvania with Ian McCarg, but I was not into ecology. I was into art. So I stayed at Michigan and started there. However, like the first week I got into landscape architecture, I went to our our chairperson and I said, I would like to take more advanced courses in art because I I was also doing some really giant things in ceramics. And I wanted to just continue to work on that. And he said, well, what does art have to do with landscape architecture? And I said to him, I said, you know, I really don't know. He says, well, there is nothing 
connected between art and landscape architecture. And at that point, it was like, oh, this is going to really be bad. This is not what I want to be doing. And I, I just kind of hung in there for the first year. So I stayed there for a year. And after, at the end of the year, somebody said, well, you, you know what? There's a program you can go out for the summer out in California. I thought, well, you know, I've never been to California. I've been to Europe for years, but not California. So I went out there and uh, went to the SWA group. And that was an office that Peter Walker had. And I was there for the summer, but I knew I went to the back room and there were a hundred men. There were no women in the back, nothing. I thought, oh, well, I mean, they're not going to hire me. I don't know what I'm doing in landscape architecture anyway, so I'm just going to have fun. So the problems that they gave us, I just continued to basically address them as an artist. That grew some interest from some of the people, including Peter Walker. Long story short, what happened is two years later, I left the University of Michigan and finished my last year up at Harvard. Pete actually went to Harvard that year and started teaching. And uh, my transfer over to Harvard was such a mishmash that I was able to actually spend a whole year under his tutelage. And he was very supportive of what I was doing because he was interested in that too. So I was able to kind of get through landscape architecture, learning something about landscape architecture and ecology and trees and plants, but I was able to keep on going in terms of wanting to make art. And that just kept me going. And I finally decided I had to go out on my own because somehow I wasn't really fitting into the the different companies who were landscape architects at the time. So I went out on my own and then started my own company and decided that I didn't want clients. I wanted patrons. I wanted people to be able to come like an artist. And if they like what you do, they they want that. And so very slowly, that happened. So it sounds like your approach to landscape architecture was very much informed by your early work as an artist. And you just mentioned that one of the reasons that you founded Martha Schwartz Partners uh, was because you you felt like you just didn't fit in. When you began the firm, did you have a specific vision of what you wanted to do, or was that something that evolved over time? I didn't have a specific vision because working outside, you have to take the context, right? You actually go and see a site that somehow sends a message to you, or you know, you you see it as something that could be something else. It's really about the context where you go. So I didn't have a specific idea of what I would do other than to look at the context of a space and react to that. So you're a strong advocate for uh, for the environment and for combating climate change. How did that element enter into your work? Making beautiful spaces and things that would create a memory or have value or are kind of a cultural kind of messaging is important. But looking into the future, and I have three children, I really was shattered because their future is in danger. And I was part of what we what we've been doing, you know. I mean, I, I was born in 1950, so I've put up a lot of carbon dioxide, and I just decided to try to figure out what I might do. There was a a group meeting in uh, Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, where a group of top landscape architects were asked to come together through the uh, Landscape Architecture Foundation, and it was a, almost a celebration of Ian McCarg and a few other very well-known landscape architects about a declaration they had made 60 years ago and that they asked 25 people to come up and give a declaration about what the next 60 years are going to be like or what we need to do. And so I was one of those people. This is a profession that can best tackle climate change because through landscape architecture is the natural carbon dioxide removal profession. And it was like, this is what we need to be doing. Landscape Architecture Foundation really went with that, and they really have started and pushed forward landscape architecture and our role in climate change. So I was very grateful to them. 
So, Martha, what's the unique role and opportunity for landscape architecture in making change in the built environment? I would say that at this point, the profession of landscape architecture is still seen as, you know, an afterthought. We still, after all this time, are seen as, you know, the the subservants of architecture. We decorate their buildings, you know, it's the last thing that comes up. It's always, you know, the the place where you can take out the budget from landscape and, you know, finish up what you need to do in architecture. It's it's a small profession, it's a rather new profession. It's really not thought about as having real agency in the design and building of cities. It's an afterthought. And this is really a big mistake for all of us to really consider the land and nature as being irrelevant, but we do. I don't know. I think about this a lot. It's like, well, we must really have had a major break with understanding, number one, what we're facing in climate change. Number two, what we're going to need to be able to deal with it within cities. And number three, which is the most important, we don't understand how important nature is. You know, landscape architecture is the only profession that works with living systems. It's the only one that understands how nature works and what it provides for humans and everything else that's living on the earth. And the problem with climate change is that we're pretty much wiping out what the earth provides for us. And that's going to be extremely, extremely taxing and dangerous for us as a species. We we can't actually make it while we're completely degrading the way nature works. We have to stop doing things the way we used to do things because the way we used to do things have gotten us into a very bad spot. The temptation is to abdicate our responsibility and perhaps not challenge ourselves to, to see natural systems as an integrated part of the whole solution in a new way, we have to find different ways that we can uh, recognize and incentivize uh, a change in the way that the profession looks at what it does and it looks at these problems. I'm wondering how much that idea of incentivizing change or recognizing new ways of thinking are part of the Obel Prize. Well, that is one of the ideas that we had for the Obel Prize. We wanted to celebrate the project, not the person. And we started the Obel Prize based on the background of climate change and what we're looking at. And we're looking for people who are showing ideas, new ideas, building them, And these ideas are in support of really addressing climate change issues and the issues that people are facing. It's a very, very interesting uh, group of people who are talking about this, you know, about, you know, what we should be doing every year and what we should be focusing on. And our focus is really to find projects that are not necessarily just because they're beautiful, but they're performative. It's really important that they're doing something in behalf of humanity, really. So you were part of developing the criteria for the Obel Award? Yes. And how did you get involved with that? I was still living in London. I was asked to come and have a lunch. And I was like, uh, why am I here? You know, I I mean, I'm a landscape architect. I think they wanted to start off with a kind of a new, you know, a, a, a different way of looking at things, which is getting a female landscape architect as being the head of the jury on an architecture uh, award. And um, I I love that idea. It seems like the Obel is unique in that it, it doesn't limit itself strictly to one discipline or another. It seems to recognize uh, kind of contributions in a different way than other prizes. How accurate is my read on that? I think that's correct. I think that's kind of where we're going and and want to be, where we're asking for kind of a wider breadth of ideas coming in. And they could be 
landscape architecture, or they could be architecture, or they could be, you know, something else like this, this year, we're coming out with something else. I'm not going to talk about that. But, you know, um, real contributions to the built environment. I think that that's kind of what we're looking at. And because we have different professions mixed in there, that's what happens. You know, it's, uh, and, and I think what is so important about this is that part of our problem is that we still are all within our own little silos. And that's, all, that's also true in academia, or certainly my academia. We don't even know what each other does. And the problem with climate change is that it's very, very complicated and complex. And unless we know what each other is doing or knows what we're, we should be doing or trying to do, we can't really integrate our thinking, which is a real problem. We need to imagine what the future is going to be and go in that direction. But you need a lot of bright people who are thinkers and have knowledge and try to figure out how we're going to do this next iteration of humanity. How is it that you think we can increase the pace of change? How is it that landscape architects and others in designing construction of the built environment can help us find faster ways to address the urgent climate needs in front of us? Having a group of people who are like-minded, who want to actually make change, or even understand that we need change, and, you know, drastic change in terms of what we're facing. I mean, when I, when I lecture, you know, it's like most people do not understand how critical a position we're in. Most, most people who are kind of looking at the IPCC and the, the focus on emissions, that is where we've all been. However, the reality is that emissions are for the future and adaptation, in other words, protecting ourselves is like now. And the reason is, is that natural systems are very, very slow. And if we were to, if we were to stop emissions tomorrow, I think most people think that, oh, we've, we've dealt with climate change, but that isn't true. What's going to happen is if we were to stop emissions tomorrow, the earth will continue to heat up for decades. One of the most important parts of making change is occupying a new role. And that role is very public uh, and it's very vocal. So it sounds like what one of the things that needs to happen is an increase in advocacy. Yes. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an advocate for the profession of landscape architecture and how important that is now. And that how we actually work with the land and how we actually organize our cities and how what we're going to need in the future. We're going to need more food in cities. We're going to need water in cities. We're going to have to deal with, with flooding. We're going to have to deal with urban heat island effect. Buildings can't deal with urban heat island effect. They make urban heat island effect. And that is the most dangerous of all the impacts that we're going to be feeling in every city. But in terms of planning, we're going to have to actually find more land within cities in order to deal with the heat, with the floods, you know, uh, dealing, trying to really protect ourselves from vector-borne diseases. We're going to have to be able to produce food for ourselves. And, you know, the amazing thing is that this is the most important time I've ever been in where there is so much invention happening all over the world. Things are popping out all over the place, you know, like micro infrastructure, where we can make smaller areas of infrastructure that people can actually have access to and deal with and to put in. We're going to have to reshape our cities so that we are organized more in neighborhoods where we're going to need each other to deal with stuff. I mean, there's so much involved in shaping our world to deal with the world that we've actually created and to actually regenerate the world for our future. Things are going to change. In order for us to live the way we do in the United States, we'll need four and a half Earths. And we don't have four and a half Earths. So we're going to have to learn to live within a budget. So, Martha, an important part of uh, being successful is understanding what success looks like. And, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could make everything the way that you wanted it to be, what would that success look like? That we would be able to deal with climate change. 
helpful that we would figure out what needs to be done to set it right and what needs to be done to make a future for our children. I would hope that our professions, the built environment, which is very important, would come together as a group of people working together, not in silos, but within each other's areas and how we actually make it work together. And they have to understand that in order to make what they're doing work for people, that it involves working with what the earth can provide for us and how we can use it to protect us. That's going to be important. Are you optimistic? I am optimistic. And the reason is that I've been studying uh, geoengineering ideas that scientists are working on. The scientists are working on ideas that actually affect the climate. So in one sense, a lot of the people who are working on this are working on how to almost reverse engineer the climate. But there's one idea that could actually cool down the earth. I think that is going to be highly likely that we're going to need that the way we're going. And it's based on why volcanoes cool down the earth when they actually erupt. And that has to do, what they're doing is they've modeled how volcanoes do cool the earth. And when they actually erupt, they put sulfates into the atmosphere. And sulfur is a very highly reflective material. That's why Venus is so bright. And they reflect the light and heat back out into outer space instead of letting it get trapped. So the idea is to put up these sulfates into the stratosphere, and that would have to continue for many, many years to actually brighten the atmosphere and reduce the amount of sun coming in. And that would buy us time to be able to get to renewables and to do what we didn't do. You know, I've worked with the people at Harvard who have been working on this. There is a lot of contention about it. There's a lot of pushback about it, but it's the one thing that we have on the table that can cool down the earth. Well, it sounds like a combination of changing our own perspective, working together better, uh, new technologies and bold ideas are the thing that, uh, that might save us in the end. Yes, I believe they will. Well, fantastic. Well, Martha, I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity again to thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us and to thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, in education and in professional practice and in helping shine a light on fantastic things that design can be doing through the Obel Prize. Well, thank you so much, Bob. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of This is Design Intelligence. The producer is Laura Spells. The sound engineer is Jared Knabel. This has been a DI Media Group production.